Good evening, YouTube. Duty Ron back in with another episode and another show. And tonight I have a special guest. I actually have two special guests. But our main event, our special guest, is a journalist, an author, and a just overall, all-around good human being. Nancy Rommelman is going to be joining us in a short period of time, along with Bill Cannon. You know Sergeant Bill Cannon. But, of course, everybody knows me, a retired New York City police detective with 20-plus years of law enforcement. And if you like all things true crime, please hit that subscribe button, hit the notification bell, so you will get all things duty, Ron, when I go live or when I upload another video. So, guys, let's get right into it. Um, Nancy has written a book in the past, a couple of years ago, but not too far in the past, she put out a book called To the Bridge, and it is all about Amanda Stott Smith, a mother of two. Actually, she had three children. She took her kids one night at one o'clock in the morning up in Portland over to a bridge, and she one by one dropped them off the bridge. She successfully killed one of her children and the other one, the girl, survived. So I want to just set up really quickly for you, show you guys a small clip. Thank you for everyone who has uh, supported me through Patreon, through channel memberships, through positive interaction, and subscribing to this community. I greatly appreciate my moderators and everyone who positively interacts. So let's get this, let's, let's get this show going. I'm going to share the screen. It's, a, it's about three minutes, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, um, to cut it down to, to shorter than that. So let's watch this quick clip to the bridge, and it's going to give you the backstory Shocked, on everything. And baffled our community. What would drive a mother to go to the Selwood Bridge and then throw her two young children okay, down that's into not the it. river? That's not it's it. Not Duty, <laughs> Duty Ron's having technical difficulties. All right, give me two seconds. Research, I got this, Brazier. kids. Sit down with her. All right, here we go. To publish to the bridge. Second time's the charm. Let me go back. Horrified and baffled our community. What would drive a mother to go to the Selwood Bridge and then throw her two young children down into the river? Well, tonight, a Portland-based author and journalist is sharing what she's uncovered during years of research. Our Amy Frazier sat down with her as she prepares to publish to the bridge. It was the middle of the night and more than a 70 foot drop from the Selwood Bridge. The scream started over here right across by Oaks Park. On May 23rd, 2009, Amanda Stott Smith dropped her young son and daughter into the dark cold waters of the Willamette River. To all those that I've hurt, especially my children, I am deeply sorry. Seven year old Trinity survived. Her four year old brother Eldon did not. A Portland fire rescue boat was later named in their honor. I'm here to honor him because I miss him so much. Their mother, Amanda, was sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole after 35 years. No explanations of um, the thoughts of the murder who killed my son will ever make sense to anybody. It's a feeling we also heard from the community. Boggles the mind. I don't know, it's just too, it's too much. So none of it makes any sense to me. I completely agree with those sentiments, and I think that's exactly what people do think when they hear mother, you know, drops children, young children from a bridge in the middle of the night. From the moment she learned of the crime. As a mother, as a journalist, as a human being. Portland-based author Nancy Rommelman needed to know more, and the life road. Amanda traveled to get herself and her children to the bridge. because. I think we are better off at least having some idea of how this happens, as opposed to saying we're never going to understand. I just don't see how that helps anything ever. Eight years ago, she began pouring through public records and interviewing family and friends willing to speak with her. Does it make sense to you now? It does make sense to me now. In June of 2018, she'll publish a book called To the Bridge. She agreed to share with us now some of what she's learned. So to say no one could ever have seen this coming, which many people said, it's just, it's just not the case. I mean, you can't say like, oh, we knew two children were going to be thrown off a bridge, but they knew disaster was in the making, for sure. 
Rommelman researched a troubled marriage. There were addictions and there were lies and there were money issues. And what she describes as years of bad behavior. I, I feel sad and, you know, sometimes angry that people just made such crappy choices, you know, um, selfish choices, choices uh, driven by addiction, choices driven by the fancy lies they could tell and, and convince others of, and the people that suffered were the children. Rommelman believes Amanda's decision that night was in part an act of revenge against her then estranged husband. You know, she'd lost a lot at that point. She'd lost custody of her children. But she also says it's more complicated than well, people realize. Obviously to hurt him, sure. Um, but what else did she have at that point? She had no home, she had no property, she had no money, she had no job. She says neither Stott Smith nor her ex-husband would speak with her. And she knows there are those who feel she's only making things worse. I know I was never here to cause people more pain. I know I was never here to sensationalize everything. The book is not sensational. I thought that it would make things hurt less if we could understand how they happened. And she says if pulling truth from the horror helps prevent something like this from happening again, then all the better. When you do take the information and lay it on the ground and look at it, you can put the pieces together. And to me, it does make sense. Amy Fraser, Coin Six News. All right, folks. So that gives you uh, an overview. Uh, a very tragic case, uh, a case of a husband who uh, was narcissistic in a lot of my research that I did for about 20 minutes here. I'm going to introduce to you uh, author and journalist Nancy Robin. Thank you so much for coming in. I appreciate hey. it, Robin. You are. Uh, I tell you, I watched you last night on my good friend, Sergeant Bill Cannon's uh, Police Off the Cuff, and I was just sucked in to all of the good th things that you've done. Uh, between this book oh. and between um, the interview with John uh, Wayne Gacy, uh, it was right up my alley. So thank you so much for taking the time to come on to the uh, live stream here. Well, thank you for having me. And I love the way you say, you know, done so many good things. You know, Ron, to some people would be like, oh my God, what kind of crazy stories, including like my, my mother once said to me, why are you always writing about dead children? I'm like, I don't know, mom seems kind of important. I don't know. Um, they are stories that are fascinating because from the outside they look, they're so inexplicable. And that's, I mean, it's sort of what a detective does, right? You had to go in and figure out what's going on here and as the writer, it's also, why is this going on? That's your right. job. Right. What, what, what we have in common and the parallels here, even though we do so much, such, such different careers and different things is the, the crime cases and the actual stories behind them. Mm -hmm. That's what, uh, I think for me, that's what sucks me in is that, you know, as a New York city police detective, we were there dealing with the crimes bill in the homicide squad, me in the warrant squad. And when I pick people up from war the warrant squad, I'd go to the other jurisdictions and I'd be in the car or on an airplane for hours with these people. And some of them were murderers. Some of them were rapists. Some of them were, you know, just, you know, predicate felons that were just life a crime. But I would pick their brains apart and speak to them. And my fellow detectives that were there with me would say, Ron, will you shut the fuck up. You know, we're sick of hearing mm. you talk to these guys because we just want to get them back and bring them to jail. And you're hit, sitting there having getting a life story out of them. Yeah, but that but now you under then you start to understand how human beings work. And also, I mean, you know, a lot of people don't want to give uh, the humanity to the rapist or to the the mother who kills her children. But I I feel that you know if I had not considered these people human beings and 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 had some, I don't think that empathy is the right word, but the need to understand them. I guess you are offering them some humanity in a sense. And I just don't see that there's anything wrong with that. I just, yeah. I just can't, I can't say, I know people disagree. They're like, yeah. they don't deserve it, but listen, I don't, I don't <laughs> disagree at all because I come from that same mold. My aunt was a Catholic nun. Okay. Uh, she was a sister of mercy. She does a commentary on 1010 wins for over 50 years. Oh, 1010 so, wins. Yeah, sister, I remember Camille, sister Camille Darienzo. So, um, she does, uh, she's been doing for over 50 years every Sunday morning uh, with Roy Lloyd and the whole crew over there. As a matter of fact, 
my my uh, my other aunt who's um in her 80s she was battling cancer in the hospital and my aunt the catholic nun of course was with her whole clan praying at her bedside mm -hmm. uh every day but when it came time to tape uh the station manager from 1010 winds came to the hospital in bayshore in long island and did her shows she was my uh, my aunt who was fighting cancer was in the hospital for four months so i saw many times them come in and tape you know and that's how dedicated she was to it but again i heard you speak on bill's show about you know your your thoughts on the death penalty and you know because mm -hmm. i'm a catholic you know it's in our religion that you're you know yeah thou shall not kill right yep. yep my aunt came to me as i was a young police officer and handed me the uh, cuomo declaration of non uh not not having a convicted uh, murderer put to death and I had a hard time with it because of mm -hmm. my profession, and I refused. Mm -hmm. But I refused in a respectful way and mm -hmm. in a loving way, and she accepted it. But she wanted me to sign uh, that declaration, and it was just in between when Pataki took over and mm -hmm. uh, and he reinstituted it. But uh, Bill, thank you so much for joining. Any thoughts on that? And then we'll go forward. Nancy, uh, long time no see. Nice to see you again, <laughs> Bill. <laughs> we have a little thing. <laughs> I just want to stop meeting uh, like this. Uh, right. in, the, in these Hollywood squares, you know. Yeah, right that's right. <laughs> but now Nancy, I want to make a comment about, you know, what you did. Uh, police, what we're looking for is the who, what, where, how, and not always the why. Right. And you had to find out the why. Right. And sometimes the why is the most difficult thing to find out. There's been some major cases in the last few years, for example, the Las Vegas active shooter. They right. still don't know motive. So yeah. motive is a very, sometimes very, very difficult thing to find out. The Nashville bombing of about a month ago, they still don't know the why, you know? So I'm, I don't want to, I want to not minimize what you did. What you did was amazing to find out the why and to find the human element be behind why did this happen? And of course, you found out. I read three quarters of your book and you chastised me for not finishing I it. Didn't, but... I, did, I did it. I did it. This is what you said. You like, well, that go. You, you uh, that go, I gave um, myself up. I should have never, uh, you know, oh never well, found out. I will say at the very, very end of the book, I think it is the last, I, I sort of, I sort of foreshadow it a little at the beginning in the introduction, but at the end, here's the thing. It's like, sure, I can spend all this time finding out why, and I can have all this documentation and everything, but in the end, we are going to see through our own lenses, right? We're going, you and I might look at the exact, it's like that movie Rashomon that my parents made me watch when I was a kid. It's like there's one, there's a murder and four different people see it and they all see something different. And even if you read my book, you can get to the end and see it differently from me. But I will say that I have had numerous, numerous people say to me, I picked up your book. And I read at the beginning how you said you you thought it was possible to find out why this happened. And I thought, no way. I am never going to understand it. And they said, and by the end, I did. Now, we didn't all come to the same conclusion, but that's okay. That's fine. Yeah. Right, well, that's you, fine. You can understand why. But I mean, if you go look in any family in this world, I mean, I remember I used to work with a guy and he'd point to a building and say, there's a million reality shows in that mm. building. And there mm -hmm. the sure is. Mm -hmm. Every damn apartment could have their own reality show. Mm -hmm. So you have to understand the human condition. But you you also, some people have horrible things happen to them, yet they don't act out badly because of it. Sure. And some people have, you know, absolutely perfect lives and they act horrible. Right. You know, um, we see that a lot. We see that with people when there's no consequence for their bad previous bad behavior, they continue, you know, doing worse behavior, which is, I think, sort of one of the themes of my book. Nancy, I have a, a, a question for you because sure. I and I shared that I was going to um, have you on tonight. Yep. So I did a little pre-promoting. There's about 150, 150 some odd people in the live chat. Hi. Um, yeah. So uh, Nancy, I, I, I had some viewer questions, some people who are here in the chat that sure. sent me some questions. And one of the number one, and it, and it came from uh, women. Uh, it was no, there was no men that asked this. What was your motivation for writing this book to the bridge, and what attracted you to this case? You know, it, 
some people said to me, well, it was because you're a mother. I am a mother. But I I don't really know. I mean, that may have played a part in it. It was just such a horrible thing to do that I knew I knew it didn't come out of the blue. Nothing comes out of the blue. I've written about so many people that do durable things and there's always they always walked to where they got. All I knew is I read that little tiny snippet in the Oregonian even before she'd been found. They'd only found kids in the river. They didn't even know who the kids were. Uh, and I knew I had to find out. It was like um, my husband will say, and I re I'm repeating something I said on Bill Bill's show. My husband saw me and he's like, oh, there she goes. I'm going to, I'm going to go and I'm going to follow that story. And this one just, I, I followed it for years. Um, I just had to know, I had a burning desire to understand how this happened. And that's the best way I can explain it. Now you, you do, that's, it was a great explanation. Uh, I think that fully answered, uh, you know, the, the viewer's question, okay. but I feel like you were busy with, you know, writing for the, the different various uh, yep. things that you were doing in LA and you know you were living in Portland yep. uh, I believe at the time now you're yep. in good old New York City down where by I'm Canal from Street. back yeah. in New York City if baby. I can make it there I'll make it <laughs> that's anywhere. right come it, back to make it <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah I mean it's important for the viewers to understand you are a journalist you have you know interviewed John Wayne Gacy which yep. is a whole nother thing that we'll get into yep. about the motivation and how that all happened because I found that to be kind of fascinating too yeah. um but you um your your passion is journalism no yeah that's what yeah. i've been doing it's really that's the only do. job right. i've had as an adult i worked uh, like as a caterer when i first got out of college right. but i started right. writing um professionally when i was pregnant with my daughter i was 26 right. and i never stopped I've right. And, and now, stopped. now at 32, she's still going. That's right. Look um, at that. I, I think I have, I think I have a future. <laughs> um, Nancy, uh, really quick. I have some Patreon supporters and channel members. I want to just thank them real quick. Uh, Matt Sully. Thank you so much for being in here. Joey Brooklyn. He was over in the live stream last night with Nancy, some returning people from that came from my, uh, uh, subscribership are now back in here. Rebecca, Nice to see you. Thank you. Everybody's sending you love in the chat. No Yay. love for me and Bill, though. I don't know what's going on. I guess I guess I didn't do my hair right tonight. Yeah. So it's all well, good. You know, they got a choice. Who's prettier? You, I, or, or Nancy? I think I'd go for Nancy. I might as well shut the cameras off and leave Nancy on. Um, but so reeling it back in, I, I, I really, um, I, I, I was really, for me, sucked into this story because of the true crime element of it. And when I looked at it, it was drugs, psychotropic yep. kind of drugs, regular kind of drugs. The husband had uh, a two hundred thousand dollar inheritance from a family member. I don't know if it was the mom or the grandmother. His grandmother, his grandmother. And he was pissing it away, yep. buying gifts and drugs, and um, yep. so it was a lot of manipulation, a lot of shaming. You know, ordering yep. extra food for her and at the at the restaurants and putting her in really bad place. So. You said it yourself. You feel like she was a victim as well, and really, that's that's the truth. In a it sense. is. It definitely is the truth. But the the one thing I had, I think I had four or five people say to me that they were a toxic couple, and this is before like the word toxic was being thrown away. They right, were like right. they were like two elements that should never have mixed, and that was absolutely true. Jason, the husband's pathologies met Amanda's pathologies and boom. And um, they were attracted to each other for these reasons. He wanted to be the knight in shining armor. She wanted to be thought of as like the person you wanted to save. She wanted nice, fancy things. He wanted to buy someone nice, fancy things, but also really not really. And he was, a it was just a mess. Yeah. And, you know, it started out like it was going to look like this perfect thing and it, it was never perfect. And, um, it at a certain point, uh, other factors had to be called in. Like who had more support? Right. He had support from his family. She didn't. She was very, very, very Christian. Her pastor was saying, "Go home and obey your husband." Well, when your husband is, you know, this. No, Nancy, that was good advice, though. 
Yeah, well, it wasn't good advice, Bill. <laughs> well, hold you know, to your husband and let him oh, mentally and was, physically. Yeah, well, I, we don't him, know if it was physical. But, no, it was yeah. more, it was definitely more mental. They were abusive with each other, but I think at a certain point she was more abusive, uh, physically abusive. But at the beginning, I mean, look, he was a drug addict in many ways. Drug addicts don't behave particularly well, right? Yeah. So, yes, um, she was. You know, people have said to me, wow, I can't believe like you're blaming someone else. She did the crime. Yes, absolutely. She committed the crime. A hundred percent. But she had help uh, figuratively getting to that bridge that night. Right. But right. She was pushed that, by the actions of, of her husband. Yeah. I think one thing we spoke about last night, too, is that the husband was enabled his whole life by his family. hundred percent. And he, you know. They thought they were helping him by giving him money and treating him like the little weasel he was. Mm. And he never had to grow up and be a man. And he accepts responsibility. So we talked about how when you do that to someone who's an addict, they're just going to keep being an addict and never get help and never get better. Well, absolutely. But, you know, there are people I think that I don't know what part of the scale of the of the pathology they are on. But he also, I mean. He's got that serious narcissistic sociopathy lying, like literally one of those guys that makes you feel like he's your best friend. He, as someone said he could sell ice to an Eskimo, but it means nothing to him. And after right. this happened, do you think that this, you know, sobered him up? And I don't mean in terms of the alcohol or, or drug way. Do you think he changed? He no. didn't snap no. out of it. He didn't oh. snap out of it. No, no, no. He was the one. He made sure that he was always, he always, always looked like the grieving father on camera. Now, that sounds horrible. Like, Nancy, how can you say that? His son was murdered. His daughter was... Th- well, I can say that because I know how he actually treated those children before and afterwards. So... Let me let me ask you another question, Nancy. Um, this is also a viewer-generated question. Um, when you did your research, when you were yeah. researching this case, who provided you with the most information and who gave you the most resistance? <laughs> well, the person that gave this me this is not mo- a lead. This was a question. The the <laughs> person that gave me the most information was Amanda's grandmother, who uh, Amanda's family after this happened, they they were very close knit, but after it was so devastating that they literally could not talk about it. Like it happened, hmm. they went through the court case, and the end, we're never talking about it again. But Jackie Drilling, who was I think seventy nine at the time, she needed to talk about it, and I spent. Man, I spent so many hours with her sitting. She's sitting in her lazy boy watching Fox News. And we mm. we watched, we just, we, we she just really, welcomed you into her home. Just well, but it, you know, it yeah. took a little time, but we actually became friends. And yeah. I spent, I must have spent nine afternoons with her and she gave me a lot. She gave yeah. me, you know, writings that she'd found uh, on, on Amanda's mother's computer. And she told me history. She was absolutely right. invaluable and very loving okay right. i i asked bill this question last night where okay, did the Ron, resistance come from where, where the resistance? who 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 would give me resistance just <laughs> just take a wild guess who would not give me what i wanted can i go can i make yes, it your turn your turn <laughs> the cops <gasps> amazing ding 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 two, 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 two for two <laughs> two for two so but now this is interesting so it wasn't it was the portland police department the sheriff's department they were great uh, mm-hmm. the, the prisons, they were great. The, like the health department, great. Everybody. And, and, and interestingly, so I'm getting like pieces of it, but I needed the detective stuff and I needed some stuff and I couldn't get it. I tried for five years. I mean, between FOIA, between cajoling, between showing mm-hmm. up, between being friendly. And then your, your foil requests were denied. Denied. Oh, well, we can't do it. And it was always for a different reason. It was like, <sighs> well, the case is ongoing. Gravy. Well, wow. it involved children. Well, this and that. It was always it was always some gobbledygook. But yeah. right toward the end, again, I can't name this person because I don't want to get this yeah, person no. in trouble. But about, I pretty much almost at the end of the book, but I really, I was stuck and I really needed them. And someone that, you know, I'd been around for five years. He trusted me. He knew I was a good egg. He gave me the police reports. Uh, so 500, 500 pages. He slipped it to me I'm, in a diner. And I'm, I, happy, <laughs> I'm happy you didn't give him up. I'm happy. So he, he was deep Oh, throat. no, no. He was so my we deep We would have had a disconnect her if she gave That's him right. up. That's right. No, I, I would never do that. And, uh, um, but no, yeah, awesome. it was, it was, but you know what? I, you know, it's interesting. I was able to write the book. Then the whole third section of the book really relies on them. But I also think that sticking around for five years, that's why I got it. 
you know, like you, you got to do the work first and yes, then you'll yeah. get it. One question. And I know, I know the answer to this, but uh, I just I think it needs to be asked. So the audience will know you asked numerous times to interview Amanda and she, oh, boy. she turned you down. Oh, right? she did. She did. And I had a, I have a good quote. So, um, you know, it had been about a year. I'd written her a lot of things. I told her things like, listen, we could talk about cookies. We could sit there in silence. I don't care. I, I know enough as a journalist, you don't walk right. in and say, so why'd you do this? Like, come on. Um, and I said to my sister-in-law, who's also a journalist, I was like, I, I don't know if I can write this book if, if she doesn't talk to me. And she's like, you know, Nancy, a lot of people have written books about George Washington that never got to talk to him. And I was like, ha. Huh. And then, yeah. and then the more and more and more and more and more I learned about Amanda, it made absolutely perfect sense that she would not speak with me. And I actually don't miss her speaking to me. And I don't think the reader will because she's throughout the book. You, you've read right. the book. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it also, it shows you exactly who she is that she wouldn't. Now, if she had, that would have been a different right. book. But um, I, I didn't, at the end, wind up missing her not speaking with me. I think that she also uh, felt that you and others would judge her more if uh, you spoke to her. She said she had told people uh, that came back to me and said I was just up to, um, you know, dredge up, you know, her her crime and that she'd been forgiven by God and and she didn't need any other forgiveness and she thought I was out to make a buck off of her. That's yeah. was her okay. feeling. And that that brings me to my next. Uh, yep. Thank you for thank you for saying that. Sure. Um, last night, about fifteen messages came across in the chat because, of course, I was there as an observer. Okay. I wasn't trying to interfere. Um, but uh, people asked that question: Did Nancy? Um, share any of the profits of that book with her? And I know the answer to it, but I'd like you to answer that so people can just put okay. their minds at ease. So sometimes it, it, it happens like that. Okay. So I did not share any of the profits with Amanda Stott Smith. I've offered to be in touch with Amanda many, many times. I offered to put money in her account. She never responded to me in any way. So to me, Amanda is not the person. The people you would, I would feel that I would want to be involved with would be her children. Yeah. Um, obviously, she actually had four children, one of whom she gave up for adoption, which we'll right. get to in a second. But um, uh, I have been in touch pretty closely with Gavin, her oldest son. Um, I never did give them any money. And I got to tell you, I thought many times about setting up something for Trinity. Who is the daughter that survived? Oh, but survived. here's here's the problem. How old is she now? Eleven or twelve? She no 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 Wait, much she's older. Like sixteen, right? She was yeah. it was she was seven in two thousand nine. Helped me with math, so she's eighteen. Oh wow. She's eighteen. So here is the problem with giving money to Trinity, who is in her father. Her father took custody, though that she was living with her grandmother. I don't actually know where she's living right now. Any money that I would set aside for Trinity, a college fund, her father would spend. Her father would spend it on drugs or whatever. And he would get a hold of it somehow and it would not reach her, period. Yeah. Yeah. I, I know that. I know right. that. I have been in touch, though. Um, as I was telling Bill last night, right before the book came out, I got an email from someone saying, I need to talk to you about your book. It was the child Amanda had given up for adop adoption. Option. She'd wow. never met her mother. And what she needed was information. And she wow. needed to be seen. And I flown out. I flew to Arizona and I spent time with her. Oh, so nice. I was not involved financially with Amanda's children, but oh. I've been Im involved emotionally with Amanda's children and I dedicated the book to them. Well, that's so, admirable. That's, you that's know, nice. That's nice, Nancy. Thank you for, uh, you know, explaining that. Um, Bill and I were talking before you came on and w when you came in in, in in the green room back there and you heard us talking some shop talk it was shocking uh, yeah she, she came in right at the heart most <laughs> he was part. almost gonna cancel her, her <laughs> we were talking about we were talking about gacy that scumbag so uh, you understand it was mm. we were talking shop and it was mm -hmm. business um but prior to that uh bill and i said we want to do a deep dive true crime episode maybe two episodes about this amanda case about this oh and um, we would like to uh, invite you to perhaps Absolutely. come back and contribute Absolutely. to that. And I'd maybe we could also simulcast and do it on your YouTube channel, which I will link yes. below. So we can do a live that will be going here and a live that will be going on yours. And we can have share our folks because I have, you know, like 30, almost close to 30,000 subscribers. And what's the, what's the name of that YouTube channel? 
Oh, I have it right here. Coincidentally, it is um, Pal- Pal- Paloma. Paloma Media, and it is right here. Here's um, her YouTube channel. I'm going to share that screen so you guys can see it. She's just getting started. I am. So don't, don't judge. It's got 140, just, 140. It's a week. Sub- it's a it's a week old. So, um, but Hold we've on. got a. Let me do something. Oh, everybody else should do that too. Yes, everybody um, in this chat. There's 170 right. people. Go on over and let's double her subscribers. Now you're going to see the numbers I here. I love it. Gonna it's, gonna go ding, 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 ding. it's like a slot machine. No, we really have some interesting content up there, I think. It's fun. Yeah. It's a lot of don't, fun. Don't leave this stream now. Go back at the end because what I will do is link it down below. Oh. It will be a clickable link down below. <gasps> her Instagram, her Facebook, all of, I mean, whatever she's got. I don't have fake book. All I do is Yeah, I'm never on Facebook. Yeah. Twitter. So, I'm on Twitter all the time. Yeah, I, sh- I show you Twitter. Um, I'll link that and all of the social media that you want. Uh, Great. Links to her Amazon. Uh, you you could purchase the book oh, cool. through, through my Amazon affiliate. That's good. So, that's good. Um, uh, so that's her YouTube channel. Uh, I went and looked at some of the videos. Pretty cool. And she, her and uh, hubby and a couple of her friends are getting together. And they're going to give some really good content. Um, if you... If you don't mind, I'd like to segue into John Wayne Gacy. Please. Okay. So this is a uh, heinous serial killer. I mean, Bill covered this. He went on a spree from, it looks like, 67 to 78. And then some people say 72 to 78. I think that's what I read, but I read two different things. So a six-year murder spree, 33 young men. and At least. Yeah. At least. Um, They found 26 of the victims in a crawl space underneath his home. I don't know how the fuck he pulled that off without the odor getting. I mean, Bill, we've been to DOAs where, you know, there's stuff behind a wall. And it is, I don't know how you mask 26. It it, it got to the point where this psychopath was dumping people in the river because he didn't have any more room at his mortuary at home. Um, So, yeah, he uh, just a horrific horrific human being uh I, I would call him a monster he was put to death by lethal injection five yeah. uh, may 10th 94 in crest hill illinois at the correctional facility um nancy went over and i want you to tell the story because sure. it sounds ridiculous coming from me tell it's, the viewers how you got that interview sure so i lived I'm in la full screen. okay i lived in los angeles at the time and I knew a young guy through a mutual friend, uh, Ricky Gaez. He was 25. He was an artist. He was in a band. And he had become pen pals with John Wayne Gacy, which John Wayne Gacy had a voracious appetite to communicate with people. And he was also a painter. And he was actually kind of a really interesting and good painter. And he painted like celebrities, portraits, Johnny Depp and all this and blah, blah, blah. And he had given Rick a couple of paintings. And Rick felt, you know, Rick was Catholic. Uh, and he just felt like he really wanted to see John Wayne Gacy before he was executed. And uh, John put him on his visitors list. You know how that works. You got to be put mm-hmm. on the visitors list. So somehow uh, Rick thought it would make an interesting story. I was a young journalist. I had never written a feature in my art life, but I pitched it to a magazine called Details. They thought it was an interesting thing. We were going to drive cross country from, from LA to Illinois, visit Gacy and write that story. Well, what I did is I I wound up taking sort of the emotional temperature of people as we crossed the country. We sat in a strip club in Vegas. We went to a... Um, Sounds like it's up my alley right there. It was, a, it was like <laughs> old kind of crusty fun girls with gl- glitter gulch. And, you know, I met people and we told them where we were going and we would get their impressions. And, you know, sometimes people were like yelling about it. Sometimes people were laughing about it. Some people p- people were like, oh, I'd kill that mofo. And um, we did that, you know, in four different stops across the country, including with some relatives of mine who took me to church and prayed for me. And it was just sort of an interesting thing because as we know, you know, why in the world would we be invested in John Wayne Gacy? He did what he did. And we are the people that create the monster. Yes, he's a monster what he does. What he does is monstrous. But we are the people that create the image. So as we're crossing the country, he's said to be executed. It was two or three weeks in the future. It was really close. And we'd stop at bars and he'd be on the TV and people would be like, fry that, blah, blah, blah. Or you'd get the guy in the bar stool next to me who said he's still a human being. So I thought this was really fascinating. Then we got in to, well, we actually had to wait. They wouldn't let us in for a couple of days. And then we got in to see Gacy, who was, as I've said before, 
he was about as threatening as your neighborhood dry cleaner. And we were sitting right at a table with him. There was no plexiglass. Uh, he was handcuffed. And he's like, hey, you kids, how you doing? Can I get you some smokes? We make them here, you know. How about a burger? Hey, so-and-so. He's, he's talking to the other death row inmates across the hall who are sitting there with their death like row a celebrity. Group. Oh, yeah. The death row groupies were there with their boobs hanging out of their tops. It was just like. Hold ugh. on. I got to stop you right there. Okay. We have, I covered a major, major um, family annihilator, Chris Watts. And I know that you've heard of this guy uh, over in Colorado. He I murdered haven't, his, actually. I okay, haven't. All right. Well, I'll, I'll just go over it just very, very briefly. And Bill, I still have you. I just, uh, I just, I want just two people on here. So, Bill, you're still in the stream. Um, so Christopher Watts in, in uh, I believe 2018 in August, he, um, becomes estranged from his wife is cheating on her on the side and she goes away to, uh, on a business trip. She comes back, she's pregnant. Um, she has two little, they have two little daughters. He, um, basically killed his wife, his unborn uh, son. He killed the two daughters, uh, strangled them and put them in oil tanks and buried his wife in a shallow grave. The reason I'm telling you the story is I covered the story um, on this YouTube channel, and he has now, to this day, women coming there in yep. bikinis and pen palling them. This is a common phenomenon, mm -hmm. and I don't know what type of psychiatric problems people have or the uh, that sexual attraction to someone who's annihilated their family and someone who's killed 33 plus people. Um, it, it just it's a thing. And you got to witness it live and in person when you went to, to meet well, him because that girl was telling you, oh, he likes this. He likes that's that. That's right. right? Yeah, get, get you on sweets. He likes sweets. Well, what I also told Holy <laughs> <laughs> what I also told Rick, you know, here's the thing about these charming, I call them charming sociopaths because I've interviewed so many of them and they're very charming in yeah. many ways. And they have the ability to make you feel like you are so important to them that you get them in ways that other people do not and i think for women it's usually has been to be women over 90 percent of the prison population are men right, right yeah. so it's women so it's like he, they start a pen pal relationship and the guy makes them feel like you get me you get me you complete me and they're lonely and they're like oh my god i'm needed and and it's also like in a way it's sort of like a safe thing and they can they can just feel it's a snow job. It's right. a snow job. You know, well, I Nancy, we spoke about this uh, yesterday. That's part of their con that yep. they snow that's how job. they're the able snow job. I like right, that analogy. They're that's able a to good con one. their the victims to get them to um you know to do what they want them to do. You know, it's Absolutely. A, it's, it, it's a salesman, but with a with yeah. a twist of con, you know. Bill, I gotta tell you, when COVID and everything is over, maybe in a year from now or whenever, we gotta oh. go out with Nancy and her husband oh. and have a drink with we them. We gotta have a drink and we're, with Yale. We're we Yale, coming Yale, to the city. Yale, we, Bator, we, we got, <laughs> Bill, you're gonna have to strap. You're gonna have to come from Westchester strap. Me, I got my grass with my Glock in my uh in my the small on my back. So I'm guilty as charged. I'm coming strapped for our protection. Sounds great. But um but yeah, what what kind of vibe did you get from this guy? Um, people want to know. I'm looking at the chat. Everybody is All just right, going I'll, nuts for I'll this Gacy. You. I mean, All we right. should have talked about this from the get. Well, right. we'll talk now. So Gacy was, you know, he's kind of portly guy. He was in his 50s, garrulous, talking, talking, talking. This guy, I am telling you, this is mm -hmm. in 1994. He'd still be talking to me and Rick if we let him, if they didn't, if they didn't push us out. He oh, wanted to know everything. He wanted to do this. He wanted to know about my sex life. He wanted to do he what? he whoa, 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 whoa. Oh. wait a minute. Hold on. Yeah, she Hold just tried on. to skim right past that. You see that? <laughs> yeah, what you see, you see how quickly she did that, Bill? <laughs> what the I fuck? I what, what was like that? Okay. You okay. Sex? okay, I'm gonna uh, we I, need I, to know. Okay. you I'm must gonna, tell. I'm gonna be Gacy now. I'm gonna I'm gonna be Gacy. So Ron, Ron, you can tell me. You can tell me. Have you ever been with a guy? Go ahead. No, no, it's okay. You can tell me. You can tell me. You know, it's okay. Now, as I know, as I was telling Bill last night, the thing with these people with sociopaths is they want to get, they, you know, you're their best friend. They understand. They want you to tell you that you're their secrets, like your worst secrets or your most secret secrets, <sighs> right? Not only because they, they eat this up because they're perversions or whatever, but right. because they are going to save that. They're going to take that little piece of information. The and they're going to use it against you 
at a time when it's most opportune for them to humiliate you, to rob you, whatever it is. Now, Gacy was going to be Gacy was going to be two weeks before he's dead. Right, before but he he's can't stop. Leaving. The leopard doesn't change his spots. Like so. Yeah, so what if yeah. I told him like, I, yeah, I kissed a girl once, which I didn't yeah. tell him. But like, if I did, like, what's he going to do with that? This Do we time, know if this guy was uh, talk about was that he, a little bit? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was very young. <laughs> I was young. <laughs> Did he, ask you to, did, he, did he ask you to unbutton one more button on your shirt? I mean, no, that he was not. Pretty... He was he, okay. So he was interested in Rick, or he should have been interested in Rick, right? Because Rick completely fit the profile of the people he killed. Rick was twenty-five. He was right, a handsome right. guy. He, he had very vivid features, and you know, John Wayne Gacy. He was married to a woman, different women at different times, right. but he was yeah, he killed young. Wives. Yeah, at different times, he he killed you know he killed young men and and performed hmm. sex acts of them when they were, you know, it, while he was, was torturing that them. His father also abused him and pushed him and t talked yeah. down to him and you know this. The more I looked into it, the more I saw it, it came from his upbringing a little bit. Some of his some of his you know problems that he had. Well, we was he ever abused. diagnosed as a, pi a abused, bipolar? Or the abuser, or right. I'm sorry to interrupt. The Say abuser. That again? The abused becomes the abuser. That's the. Yes. But you know what I do think, though? I think, you know, we all have predilections. I mean, you know that if you have kids, you got one kid yeah. that's like this kind of personality and it's the same yeah. parents, but it's a totally different personality. And, yeah. you know, we, you know, we love our children. We treat them well and, you know, they, they grow up OK. But, you know, if you treat a child badly, you might be able to activate something that wouldn't have been necessarily activated. And I think someone like a Gacy had some probably some predilections you mm. know and then mm. they were activated by the way he grew up and not having consequences and these lying and, and all this kind of stuff so yeah. um yeah. you asked if he was bipolar i don't i don't know the answer to that question I just, but yeah i was just wondering if he actually was diagnosed because a lot of times when they get it, it took um what 15 or 16 years for him to get you know that's a whole other thing that you guys conversed about a little bit, i don't even yeah. want to get into that but um, it took 16 years for them to uh, to kill this guy. And I know the FBI, the profilers, they get a hold of people like this and uh, they want to try to, you know, learn something from them. So I, 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 I'll find out. I'll, yeah, I also that was, think that was one of my Patreon folks that wanted to know that. And I, but, I don't know, nor does Nancy, nor does Bill, but we'll get to the bottom of it. But we'll I also think that bipolar, I think, you know, the, the definition of bipolar has expanded, you oh, know, yeah. over the past decade or two. And I, I don't know that that's something that they would have sort of been looking to, uh, apply at to that, him at that time. Yeah. At, that time. at that time. Good point. Yeah. Good point. Yeah. Um, you know, Ron, one, of the, one, of the thing, one of the things that he was that a lot of people may not know is he used to dress as a clown. He, yes. he, he, yes. he went to him. He was dubbed the killer clown. <laughs> And he was the Pogo, the clown, and he, he there was a couple, there was one more odd term that he used, um, Paco, well, I think. Paco, clown. you know, he, Poco, Poco, he, I have a photograph that he gave me that he signed to my daughter, who was four years old at the time, saying, oh, to, to Tava, live while you live, love, oh. Pogo, the clown. So, oh my God! I have Terrible. that. I don't know where it is. If it's I hope you have a I was just going to say. Daughter. I was just going to. I was just going to ask her, Bill. Could you please go get that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> if you I, could share that with me on an email, I mean, I, I, I don't know. You maybe, you know, he's going to raffle it off to his best patron. No, I'd like to show <laughs> my. I would like to show my supporters. Anyway, I, I, I don't know where it is. <laughs> Whatever. Whatever. Not that important. Okay, here's a great question. Has yes. nothing to do with what we're talking about. Yep. Uh, two people I saw already tonight. I saw about five or six in bills. What is the significance of the tattoo on your? Oh, that on your I, got, arm? I got a bunch of tattoos, but uh, well, this the, is this is the this is the one they're probably asking yeah, about. That's so it. I was at the uh, San Francisco. Hold on, I'm gonna make it full. Hold on, hold on. I'm sorry. She's like, I'm gonna kill you, dude. Around. No, I'm not. Sorry, I please. was at the San Francisco Museum of Art, and I saw a painting by Ed Ruscha called "Parts Per Trillion." Big, large painting in gray tones of these three ships. And it's wow. the only painting in my life I couldn't walk away from. I stood there for 20 minutes. I walked away and then like a rubber band went back. And then when I decided to get a tattoo, like about 10 years ago, oh. I thought, oh, I'm going to get this. So yeah. and those it, are it, cruise ships, like what, they're like, like they're like sailing ships, like old oh, nice. Spanish galleon ships. Wow! Beautiful. So um, I'm very I'm very happy with it, and it's a you know the painting wound up selling I think for twenty million dollars, and this cost one hundred forty dollars. So it's see, a bargain. That yeah, was a bargain. I mean I I, I got what and I wanted. I know that hurt uh, like hell because the it inside didn't. Of, really it didn't no you the know inside it, of my arm here because I have uh, 
you know, flames and all kinds of rise above statements and all this. But this part hurt right here. In, oh, well, yeah. I got to tell you, I didn't because I said to the, the gal said it was a complicated cat tattoo today, but not um, not um, yeah. sensitive. Yeah, no, I have a couple more and I've never I've, yeah. they've never hurt. What do you got? You have some writing. It looks like I have. Right? Um, I have a. It says, uh, "Listen." Listen, I see. Which it. is I kind of it. um, it's kind of an inside joke uh, with a friend of mine. And then I had a uh, a little um, sorry, where's my camera? A little scrimshaw well. whale right oh, there. Nice. That's it. Wow. I don't think I'm getting any more. I like it. I like so, it. You're all yeah. linked up, girl. Yeah. Good for you. <laughs> nice. Um. Yeah. So the geesey thing is, I mean, people are going nuts about this. Uh, Bill and I may even delve into in the future, uh, doing, uh, probably a four or five part about him. Uh, you know, we covered the Long Island serial killer, uh, yeah. over in Gilgo yep. beach. Yep. yep. Um, but we're, we're, uh, that's unfinished business. We still have a couple of good uh, shows left in us on that, but yeah, the, um, I, I want to just quickly touch on, uh, Portland and your work there. Sure. If you could tell the audience how you got engaged and involved in that and, um, I'll let you take it. As you can tell it better. Sure. So I lived in Portland from uh, 2004 to 2019. Um, I knew the city pretty well, obviously. And, you know, last May, when things really started to explode, a lot of people were asking me, you know, Nancy, what's going on? What's going on? And I was sitting at um, having drinks last July with two friends of mine, uh, journalists. And one of them was like, Nancy, what's, what the hell is going on in Portland? And the other one said, Nancy, you got to get out there because we we actually need to know and we're not getting the information. What we're getting from, we're getting from Fox, Fox News. Oh, sorry, sorry. That's okay. Sorry. Uh, no. We're getting we're getting from Fox News, you know, Savage is coming to your town and, you know, you know, they should just, you know, stop, you know, demolishing the federal building. And then we're getting their peaceful protesters on CNN. Mm. So I went out and I wound up going out there for four weeks between May, uh, July and November and writing 14 stories for Reason Magazine. People can go to Reason.com. Um, I'll and, link it down below. Yeah. I'll link Reason. And I have to say... Um, I, first of all, I love Reason. I've been writing for them for years. Some of my dearest friends are there. They gave me, they they never were like, oh, you should go do this. Just They're just like, go find the stories. And I mm -hmm. went into the streets with the people and I talked to people and I photographed people. And I think that I was doing a pretty fair job. And I think that people really, really appreciated it. They're like, thank you. I have a sense now of what's going on as opposed to feeling like I'm being forced to pick a position here uh and um it was very it was very satisfying jour journalism and i had everybody from like you know super liberal places to um to fox news that had me on for a week and a half wow. ago so uh, yeah, um yeah, yeah I, I, those, are two, those are two extremes and of course yeah. w what we always talk about is that you know you get uh, different tastes and different flavors from different news outlets and then you have yeah. journalists like yourself <clears throat> that are going to give both sides and I just want to play, and this is what rudely interrupted you, so I apologize. No, I'm sorry. I don't claim to be a professional, Nancy. So this is uh, me you neither. Know, yeah. So <laughs> I'm going to play just a small clip for my uh, viewing audience of sure. uh, some of the activities in Portland. Okay. So let's play this, and we'll we'll stay on the screen. To call for racial equality and the reform of police. Our Fox 12's Nora Hart is here in studio with a look at the protests that happened this weekend, and these marked a major milestone. Yeah, definitely, Bonnie. This weekend actually marked 100 days of protests in the city of Portland. While Saturday featured some peaceful events during the day, police ended up declaring a riot that night. The 100th night of protests started off at Ventura Park in Southeast Portland. Anywhere from three to 400 people gathered to listen to speakers and performers before they marched to the East Precinct. But before protesters even left the park, Portland police told the crowd they would not be permitted to leave the park and go to the East Precinct. This gathering will not be permitted to proceed the East Precinct. Police gave several warnings declaring the group a riot and began to use pepper balls at the crowd. This is when the night took a turn. <laughs> That's when several Molotov cocktails were thrown in the direction of the police line, falling short and hitting a protester whose feet caught on fire. Tear gas and or impact weapons. Leave it to area immediately. Fireworks were set, and this is when tear gas was deployed to disperse the crowd. Protesters broke off into smaller groups and eventually regrouped at the park again. Police moved them into the neighborhood near Ventura Elementary School and used even more tear gas. Neighbors say they could smell the tear gas in their homes 
and they say police shouldn't have pushed the protesters into their neighborhood. Mm. That was the worst decision ever. This whole neighborhood is full of kids and families and parents. This park gets more usage. All right, so I'm going to I'm going to spare us the rest of that. Um yeah, so you know, we uh, listen, I, and this is the reason I'm we're only going to touch briefly on this because you know, I I I say to myself, you were very brave for what you did because these are not um these people can become dangerous. And I know I heard you talk about yeah. it. Um, but for a woman, like if you were my wife, I, there's no fucking way that I would let you go and do that. You so, know. Um, because it's, it, 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 look, no matter how you slice it, no matter how you look at it, there is factions of people who uh, during the day want to get a point across. I worked occupied wall street in 2011. Yeah. Okay. I was there at Zuccotti park and I saw what went on there. And Basically, those folks were just obviously same type of thing with Antifa. They're calling for, you know, no, no laws, no government, no, you know, no banks. They didn't want nothing. Yeah. Uh, and I watched them camp out in Zuccotti Park for almost two years. Yeah. And even after they were taken out forcefully by the NYPD, because back then the NYPD didn't have Bill de Blasio and they had a pair of balls. They went in there and they took them out of there and they still came back. Uh, and it was kids from the Pacific Northwest a lot of them, because I talked to them. I was yeah, actually yeah. stationed there. Um, I was in One Liberty Plaza, which was the building adjacent to the park, uh, and the World Trade Center was being constructed, and these folks were there, and they were, same thing, throwing piss, throwing shit, throwing yeah. um, uh, all kinds of chemical uh, at the at us, at the mm -hmm. security and the police, and um, that's this is, there's no difference here, fast forward to 2020. They're doing the same shit. Yeah, they, they you know, at, in Zuccotti Park, they were sort of, which, by the way, I heard there was a, another occupation. They, ocu they were occupying it or hanging out there last Sunday, protesting whatever yeah. it is they're protesting now. Uh, police, probably. Um, mm -hmm. The thing about the thing in Portland, which has gone on for, you know, not every night. It went on almost every night for 200 nights, but then there were some wildfires and the weather. So now it's a right. couple of times a week. Um right. They're not in one location. They're yeah, roving they're around the yeah. city. And they are, you know, they have really worn people's patients pretty thin. But you also have people like that guy at the end there who are like, they're not, they're just sort of fundamentally anti-police. They're, yeah. they feel that these kids are making progress. And the city yeah. is sort of like, yeah. it can't really get out of, the situation it's in yeah, it's, um, well, I, I see two things bill i don't mean to cut you off because i gotta get this point out and then i'll let you go um i remember uh back at, with the occupy wall street these folks were doing their civil unrest but they weren't burning businesses no, and burning right. buildings down so that's what we've graduated to nancy and that's yep. the point that i'm trying to prove here or not prove but talk about uh is that we are going in a dark place because it's graduating to property destruction damage and people getting killed whereas at occupy wall street the people that were getting hurt were the heroin addicts fighting m amongst each other for their next fix or Yikes. the woman the guy's girlfriend who got raped by his best friend mm. that was camping out in the next tent and then they would fight and if you know uh, if you if you followed it closely greg kelly who was a fox 5 news reporter, i got i know, in the I know face. greg i know I was greg. there when greg got punched in the face Oh, uh, by I didn't one know of these that. Okay. Occupy, he got fucking socked in the face. And um, that's when all of a sudden the city of New York and the police commissioner and mayor uh, said, oh, we got to get them out of here. You know, they're attacking. Uh, that was the biggest thing. They, there was no destruction of property. There was no graffiti. There was nothing. There was just them inside there, uh, you know, defecating all over the place and yeah. making really unsafe, you know, health, public health. But there was no burning. There was no property. There was no statues being taken down. I'm sorry, Bill. Go ahead. I know you died. Uh, I, I was just going to say, um, and obviously my uh, politics are uh, a little right because I was a cop for 27 years. But as a citizen of this country and of New York, uh, and of, you know where I live in Westchester, I expect the government to protect its citizenry. And when they don't and they refuse to allow the police to do their job, and Nancy said numerous times, when there are no consequences for your behavior, that's when behavior goes off the charts. And I saw a lot of that in the past summer 
where people, you know, started destroying property on Fifth Avenue in New York City. They even went out to the suburbs on Long Island. They went out to Merrick, Long Island, which is, is an affluent Jewish community. Black Lives Matter went out there. And I was told by some retired cops that they weren't going to put up with it, that if they started doing that there, they were going to have a big problem, you know. So yeah. that's, I think, what it takes is the pushback from the citizenry. But I think the people of Portland, they're all basically really liberal left-wingers, and they they, they seem like they're putting up, putting up with this crap much longer than anywhere else in the country would. Well, I, I think that's true. I think that they have an identity as being sort of a, you know, a liberal city, a marching city, a city that it fancies itself revolutionary. Now, let's let's qualify this by saying most Portland citizens are not. I mean, they, they might be, you know, super dyed in the wool liberals, but they're family. You know, they go to work. They got kids. They're not out in the streets at all, but they kind of they kind of support these progressive ideals do they support the burning of no they don't no, no. but they also i gotta tell you it's sort of like you know i don't know if you're familiar with you know vaclav havel and the green grocer sign it's like i'll put the sign in the window that says i'm for your thing don't hurt me sort of like putting the black lives matter black, sign in black All right? business that's black right <laughs> it's like don't hurt me people don't people want to be kind of left alone they want to feel yeah. safe and if they have to not say anything then right. they won't say anything but it's been pushed too long. Uh, well, I Nancy, really I was, Nancy, I was going to say you want to see a, um, a liberal turn into a conservative, step on his land. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Know. Or well, you know, I got to tell you, they're marching through the seats and they're they're telling they're telling people you should let us sleep in your house or in your shed or on your land because Listen, you know it yeah, used to be okay. someone else's land. Opinions yeah. will always vary on this, and, and it's in part one of the reasons why I don't really like to touch on this stuff. But I think it's important because. It's, it's some great work that you did there by going and, you know, you essentially went a little bit undercover and, uh, you know, you got to document some of the stuff and the shenanigans yeah. that have gone on. Uh, and I think that was a good piece of journalistic um, work that you did there. And, and I wanted to just give you credit for that. Uh, Duty Ron, could you, uh, I think she just has to, was one thing she has to talk about that is so important. And that is how they blocked you from taking pictures Oh, uh, because they phone. wanted to yeah. put out, they wanted to put out the uh, video narrative about what was going on, and not others. This is this is very common. I think I was one of the first journalists to write about it, but others have since then, or maybe concurrent. Um, yes, this is you know they have the people that are there, the black block kids, the kids in black that are like mm -hmm. the more violent arm of Antifa. They're filming everything. Uh, they're disseminating that stuff to different news outlets, including a lot of sympathetic news outlets in Portland. Um, and, and, you know, the New York times is picking it up and then they've got times people that are sympathetic to the protesters. And so that narrative, which is peacefulish protesters, or even if they're not so peaceful, they're the ones that are being victimized by the police. Meanwhile, I'm there watching, you know, I'm watching them bash out the windows of the federal building and I'm watching them shine high powered laser beams and I'm watching them steal my phone. Actually, I was periscoping. So periscope filmed my phone being stolen. Oh. Who? What are the chances? But wow. anyway, they wouldn't let me film. They stole my phone. They put my pictures online. They called me a fascist. They identified me. They tried to rough me up because I was not on their team. Well, sorry guys, too effing bad. Yeah. I'm going to report the news as I see it. If you don't want to, if you're behaving badly, I might talk about it. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I'm glad that you were able to do it and not get hurt. You know, like I said, not hurt. You know, it's, it, it's a, it was a dangerous assignment that you took on there. And how long were you uh, actually doing that for you? Can you talk about that? Or? Sure. I went, I, I reported on the ground in Portland for about four weeks total from yeah. July to, to November. But I will say, you know, I've been a reporter for a long time. I hate being in the middle of a crowd. I do not like it. I feel unsafe. I tend to stay toward the edges so that if some stuff's going to go down, right. I'm able to get out of there. I'm also like, I'm, yeah, I, I, I mean, I've been doing this a long time right. and I'm still here. Yeah, so yeah. No. awesome. Yeah. Uh, you know, Nancy, I, I'm going to, again, I'm going to link all of your social Yay. media and your stuff down below. Uh, I'm, I'm going to, if it's okay with you, turn it over to um, a couple of viewer questions in the sure. chat. Um, sure. So some of my people who are supporters and, you know, asking some questions and things of that nature, and I'll just kind of pick 
and choose. Um, yeah, someone says Antifa sent. Let me put that on the screen. Oh, wait a minute, that's not it. Uh, here it is. This is a common thing, and, and I think you might have touched on this with Bill. I'm not sure. Antifa sent U-hauls and trucks with riot gear and bricks and things of that nature. Did you see any of that over there? Um, I did not see that, but what there are, are there are uh, lead for cars and follow cars. Okay. There are definitely support vehicles that have like water and shields, you know, these homemade shields. Right. This, um, yeah. I did not see, you know, and, and it's usually not like a U-Haul. It's like someone's yeah. van. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, but I wouldn't think you were going looking for that. I mean, that would no. be, be dangerous for you to start saying, hey, what's that? Yeah. yeah, what are you guys doing? You know, that's a good way to get yourself hurt. And so. they don't really, they don't really carry guns too often. They carry w weapons, but they are right. not, for the most no part. Guns. Though I, they're not for no. the most part. I well, have no guns seen, visible to you. Not no guns. That's you know, true. Yeah, but yeah. you also, they're sort of, they fancy themselves like these other kinds of, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So Peggy S says, "I love her." And oh hi, Peggy. You. I love you too. Yeah. Go <laughs> and subscribe. Are. Let's see yeah, what the channel. Subscribe. Let's. Let's see what's happening with your channel right now. Paloma um, Media. Hold on. Oh, let me hold on. I'm going to check it because I had it up. Tell me. Uh, let's see where we're at with uh, Paloma Media. Uh, let's see. Oh, wow. Look at that. You did pretty good. Where You're at 178 at? from 140. So I we're getting you close 38. to 200. Yeah, uh, so before it's... before 24 hours passes, I guarantee you'll be at 300. Awesome. We're trying to get to 1,000. And that's Paloma, P-A-L-O-M-A. Paloma yeah. Media. Paloma. Yeah, it's too, it's too small. Even with my reading glasses, I can't see it. Yeah. So because my my second monitor is too far back, I got to push that. I'll talk to my tech people about that. Yeah, get those uh, tech people in there, Ron. I, I apologize. So, folks, again, this is a, a wonderful guest. I got Bill Cannon on with uh, Nancy. And she, I tell you, um, if you go over to her YouTube channel, you'll be starting to see some really good stuff from her coming down the pike and um, I think we we really will in the future do a collaboration with love it. Uh, I love yeah, it. with the um, to the bridge. Go over and pick up her book. I will link it also down below in my Amazon store. I'll put also, it in there. The Gacy yeah. they can buy the Gacy if they have a Kindle or a Kindle app. The Gacy article is up there on Amazon. It's uh, like a dollar ninety nine or something. So they're, if they're interested Perfect. in that story, they can yeah. read about it. I'll link it. Bill Cannon's got police off the cuff. Everyone, go over and subscribe to him. Um, he's doing true crime stories. He had uh, Nancy on last night. Go over and watch that replay. We still have over 150 people live watching here. Wow! So during this whole one hour, we were you know uh, up in between 100 to 200 people live watching. So very very good. I I wasn't sure of what kind of fanfare we were going to have here, but everybody loves you, Nancy. Well, I'm uh, super happy to be here. Thanks, guys. Any it's any parting cool. words for the uh, audience? Final thoughts? Um. Let's just keep talking. I mean, and and let's keep writing more interesting stories. That's that's what I want to do. It's what I want to try to bring to you guys. So excellent, excellent. And you are welcome anytime to come back on the show, Bill. Anything for uh, the viewers? Uh, tomorrow night, I have um, retired NYPD Sergeant Michael Devine, who's also an actor. He was on the fa a marvelous Mrs. Meisel. He's been in the. I forget the name. I always forget the name of that new uh, series is on on HBO with. Uh, Nicole Kidman and um, Hugh Grant, but he's he's the guy is working all the time. He's probably the second most uh, successful NYPD actor after Joe Lisi. He'll probably awesome. overtake him in a couple of years, though. So awesome. tomorrow night at seven, Great. we have Great. him on. Thank you, Bill Nancy Rommelman. Thank you so much. My and pleasure. I'm thank subscribed you. to all of your social media now. So, uh, <laughs> okay, you know, if you I'll find see you online. Heart to maybe come on back. I'd love it. I'd love to right sign my book, back. Nancy. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, there bring, it it to, bring it to the bar. <laughs> bring it yeah. to the right. bar. Me, I mean, yeah, I'll yeah, I, I will. Guess what? I want a signed book too. I'll bring you a book. I'll bring you a book and I'll sign it. Yeah. All right, Nancy. Thank you so much. Take care, guys. Bye, guys. I want to say a special thank you to all my channel members, my Patreon supporters, and everyone who positively interacts here in the live stream. God bless the world. God bless the United States of America. And God bless each and every one of you. Thank you from New York City and good night. Peace.